We are live. Welcome to the Woodsman's Podcast for January. This is the first podcast of the year. Happy New Year, Ed. Ed, of course, is the working class woodsman on YouTube and Instagram. And uh, the woodsman in question in the Woodsman's Podcast, uh, Ed Butler, who is standing, uh, sitting in front of me in his um, vintage what is that? This is a 1960s uh, Woolrich. Uh, oh. Very old school. You can tell by the buttons and the thread and the mm -hmm. stitching and the thickness. Yeah. It's one of the thickest. It's probably thicker than most jackets you buy now. It's basically just a shirt. And to introduce myself, my name is Max Ledoux. And I usually do that in the other order so that I nice can Nice to mix it that, up once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I usually try to say that. I'm not a woodsman. You're a woodsman. But this but, is the Woodsman's Podcast. However, you are cloaked in some pretty good wool over there. Yes, this is Irish wool. And um, my wife got this for me for Christmas. Which is, yeah, you are wearing the hell out of that sweater, I'll say that. Really, really nice, nice, nice looking sweater. And apparently, the stitches on it um, have meaning. And almost like a maritime or something. I don't know. It is, it yeah. is unique. Yeah, it is unique. Or some sort of Gaelic, maybe. I don't know. Well, there was a booklet that came with it that explained, like, this means this and this, you know, clan uh -huh. or whatever, um, uh -huh. you know, family, um, you know, and what trade they were in and things like that. And, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, geez, so there's a lot of detail. Of, uh, and of course, I'm just, you know, culturally appropriating it. <laughs> well, we'll have to do a little research after the podcast yeah. and see what all that means. But she did. Uh, she did get it from Ireland and had it shipped over. And um, well, she's yeah. She yeah. doesn't have to do anything. Like if she buys a sweater, it's got to be from Ireland, made by yeah. Irish, <laughs> of, of Irish wool. And, yeah, very appropriate. You have the um, you have a white Irish wool sweater um, that there was a video from a few years ago when you were squirrel hunting and we'll talk about squirrel hunting in a few minutes here, but you, um, you actually skinned a squirrel while wearing a white, um, wool sweater. Uh, oh yeah. I did. Yeah. Both impressive and maybe perhaps a little bit reckless. And, yeah. I didn't, but uh, there's no blood on that sweater. No, not a drop of blood <laughs> on that sweater. It's just, it's such a warm sweater. I like to wear it and you know, yeah. as you know, when you use your stuff, unfortunately it, ends up with scars but so far that, yeah, one, but, that one has escaped i mean things are like your coat or the sweater they're meant yeah. to be worn and well, used Mor morris kohansky has a good saying and uh, uh when it comes to your stuff you know like your knives and your tools and your clothing he, he says use it use it hard and use it up if you have to but yeah. the point is you're using it, and that, that's what the stuff is made for. But it's kind of a double-edged sword because we all like to find those things, that new old stock wool shirt from 1968 that's still flawless. So, right, right. But so, I don't know, but you should wear, you should use your stuff and utilize it for what it's intended for. Yeah. You know. So let me say real quick that the Woodsman's Podcast is a um, once-a-month podcast, or at least once a month. We did have one month where we did more than one episode and that was fun and we'd like to do more of that mm -hmm. you can find us on youtube at youtube.com slash working class woodsman which is the youtube channel that includes a lot more than just the podcast so please subscribe uh, on there and we'll talk a little bit of some of the more recent videos that are on the channel but also for the woodsman's podcast you can get us on itunes stitcher or google play and you can just search for the woodsman's podcast and you can also go to workingclasswoodsman.com um, and get links to all of that and um uh, so seeing as this is the first podcast of the year when we started the podcast last year we our first episode we talked about the year of a woodsman mm -hmm. of being in the woods that mm -hmm. starts in January and goes through December. Mm -hmm. Um, and every month there's really something different that you can, that you can do. Um, and so normally this time of year it's ice fishing. 
Yeah, um, which is kind of cool about this podcast because we are. This is this is where we're starting it off in January of month. But uh, yeah, ice fishing is pretty much what is the deal now. Um, we still have the as far as the hunting seasons go. Um, of course, deer hunting's over. Uh, that was over halfway through December. Uh, up uh, partridge or rough grouse ended December thirty first. Mm-hmm. So now. Uh, we have squirrel hunting that's running through the end of this month for gray squirrel that they gave us till the 31st of January this year. Uh, snowshoe hare goes until, uh, I think it's March 15th mm-hmm. and, um, uh, not March 31st. I'll have to double check that, but it takes us into March so we can rabbit hunt or mm-hmm. hare hunt rather all winter, uh, uh, all most of the winter. Um, but yeah, the ice fishing is pretty much the, um, the, the, what we're looking to do now, but. Unfortunately, because of the warm temperatures, the ice is still pretty sketchy in a lot of places. I mean, a lot of the, the smaller ponds are froze over and people have been fishing there. Um, parts of Winnipesaukee are safe enough to go on and fish. I mean, some of the smaller bays. Yeah, that's the thing about Winnipesaukee is that it is a really big body of water. Yeah. But if you ever climb up on any of the mountains on either side of the lake and look down at it, it looks like a lot of smaller lakes because there are so many bays interconnected. Yeah. yeah. And so some of those bays, I mean, water's not that deep, right? So it, it freezes over faster. Than yeah. You will, you know, right. You know, you yeah. take some, something, uh, some of the bays with uh, like with no real Southern exposure freeze, like pier 19 freezes really quick. Um, so pier 19 and Tufton Burrow. Yeah. Uh, that freezes over a lot of the smaller places freeze over. There are places on Winnipesaukee that really never freeze. Technically, um, because of yeah. currents and, and, and yeah, there's a, streams and springs and stuff what is like that. that. Place? Is it called the Narrows over towards yeah. uh, Alton? Is that where it is? This is where, um, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, there were several deaths oh, yeah. in that area. Yeah, and that was un- it was really unfortunate because the the um, I don't know the particulars of that particular incident, but, but well, essentially, other than... Um, it uh, basically it was open water one day the next day it snowed a couple of, well it froze so yeah. we had like a skim coat and then it snowed right so it looked oh, like it looked like clear like, sailing yeah. all the way across yeah so and they but, were out on on snowmobiles and this this was a father and son actually on the same snowmobile because the son was young like 13 and they were from new york and um didn't know that that particular part of the lake is really shouldn't go there. It's sketchy at best. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. they got tricked by the new snow. Right. And, and that happens a lot when people, you know, come up for the weekend and they'll see cars parked out on one particular bay and it's like, Oh yeah, you know, they're, they're driving on one of Pasaki. Well, that, yeah. that may be okay in that particular area, but you go any, some of the other places and it's not the case. So it takes a long time to learn that lake and bear in mind, ice is never safe regardless. Right. Um, and if you go on, if you kind of approach it with that, um, I mean, I've, I've felt, I've, I fall through the ice twice a year, so I'm not, you know, I'm not I'm kind of preaching to the choir, but you, you just, you always keep in the back of your mind that ice is, ice is basically never safe, right. uh, as, as you'd like to think it is. I mean, so just be careful. Yeah. Um, that actually that day that they drowned, actually, you know, it, <laughs> This is a terrible subject for, but you know, it's it's important that we're talking about. It, this. it is, it's part of it. But yeah. that particular, actually, I just remembered what happened is that the father did not die. Yeah, and that the son did. Yeah, and I uh, just, um, that poor man and the poor man's the mother of you know of the child and. No, it's it's horrific, and unfortunately, it happens every year. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, it's most most of the time. Like I say, I go through the ice all the time, but I guess I'm, I get used to it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I know where I shouldn't be too, you know, most right. of the time. Um, and you also have some tools to try to help oh, you yeah. out. Oh, yeah, the ice picks. Yeah. And you're seeing more and more of those. Like when you see me in my videos and stuff, you don't necessarily see me with the ice picks because they're under, they're under my coat. Right. And I've got them stashed. A lot of guys now I see with the ones that go around the neck, which is fine. Yeah. But yeah, I'm – 
as as time goes on. So are yours just tied to your wrists? Or? Yeah, they're like yeah. the old idiot mittens. Yeah. You remember when the kid used to yank on your left hand and you punch yourself in the face with <laughs> yeah. the right? Yeah. Same concept. But what it is is I just turn them around and tuck them up under my sleeve. Yeah. So if ever in the event, I've got them right there and I can shake them out. Some yeah. guys have the ones that clamp around. Some guys have the ones that stick in the pockets. Yeah. Um, and these are actual spikes so that yeah. when you're in the ice, yep. you got them and you can – you know, if, it's, if you're watching, I'm doing the visual here. Yeah. You know, you can pull yourself. You out. jab them in and pull yourself yeah. out. And then if you do get in that position, um, again, this isn't a self rescue course by any stretch. But if you ever pull yourself out of the ice, don't stand up immediately. Right. Drag yourself. Yep. Stay spread eagle. You know, spread out. You know, because the more you're spread out, the less weight you're taking up in a specific area. So you're you're more apt to, you know, you can belly crawl across very little bit of ice if you if you're careful. Right. A lot of people when they get up, they immediately stand up and go right back to the ice again. And then a lot of times you're so exhausted and so cold that you can't pull yourself out a second time. So there's a lot of if you go on YouTube, there's a lot of uh, better explanations and demonstra- demonstrations on on how to self rescue and it's definitely worth a worth a, a visit i'm sensing a video in our future where we go out on a lake and you jump in jump in <laughs> <laughs> it's not out of the realm of possibility um but uh, i'd be i'd be willing to do that under the, under the right conditions yeah and the, you know maybe we already have a rope tied to a tree on the shore yeah, yeah. let's yeah let's not get too heroic here. yeah <laughs> but anyway but yeah it's something to think about i mean with with ice fishing and snowmobiling or any winter activity on the ice you just gotta you gotta keep it in the you got to keep in mind that you know yeah. you you're 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 somewhere that you shouldn't necessarily be, right? You know, um, and we started this whole discussion. We didn't maybe make it clear enough. It was you know forty degrees today. Yeah, and it is yeah. today that we're recording is uh, January fifth, uh, six, fifth, six or something. Yeah, six. yeah. And we're gonna release this later at the end of the week, but. Yeah, this is not weather that is going to. Well, it's you know we're off to a really slow freeze. slow start, and um, I don't see from what I understand or what I've researched, I haven't found any um, real cold weather coming in. That mm-hmm. I've maybe I'm not getting the right information, but here we are, you know, almost halfway through January, and it's still sketchy. So it's going to be a slow year, but yeah. it doesn't mean you can't get out and do some ice fishing. Right. You just ma- do it on smaller. Do it, you know, lakes. stick to the small ponds. Uh, test the ice. You know, when you go onto the ice, drill holes and, and get a good idea of what's under you, where you are, and uh, you know, you'll be fine if you just take a few precautions. So I was in Maine earlier today, uh, and I was driving by a lake. I'm not sure how big it was, but there were people out ice fishing, and somebody had their jeep out there. Well, and I mean, I thought, wow, I wouldn't do that. And then I thought, well. They probably, I hope, tested the ice. You yeah, know, I mean, if you got a foot, and, some of these places have a foot of ice. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I wouldn't, I'm not a fan of driving on anyway. I mean, I take my Ranger on or, or an ATV. Yeah, but that's. But I've never been a fan of driving my vehicle onto the ice. I've never liked, I've never been comfortable with that. Well, the weight difference is pretty significant. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Not that you can't go through with a four wheeler, sure. But, um, but anyways, yeah, it's something to think about. But uh, so, so, and my ice fishing's been a little bit uh, off to a slow start. I mean, did a little bit last weekend. Uh, was going out this morning uh, with uh, Randy Rodko, mm-hmm. the guy, uh, my, you know, our buddy yeah. that makes the yeah. custom ice rods, and yeah. um, good friend of the channel. Yep, yeah, I was loading up my van. And I was like, I still haven't got my 2019 fishing license. And I, oh. always, yeah, I always go on and buy the combination license. Do you have to get that on, on January 1st? Is, nope. that, is that when does the season start? It's like, well, January 1st. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you can buy it, you know, you can buy it whenever you want to go hunt, hunt or fishing. You don't have to buy it January 1st. No, I, right. But I mean, oh, as of midnight January 1st, yeah. you better have a fishing license. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like uh, having to think, well, I still haven't done it. So, all right, whatever. So run in and, you know, go online and download it. Well, the website was down. Mm. And I tried like 15 or 20 minutes. And I'm standing and there and the all state. my wool, all my wool, yeah, the state website. Yeah. So I'm standing there and all my wool clothes and I'm starting to overheat. And I'm like, this is not, this isn't going to work. Because I had to be back at noontime anyway because of another engagement. So I called up my friend Randy and I said, hey, I go, I've got an issue. I can't get online to buy my license. He says, well, I got another issue. My truck won't start. <laughs> so we're like, uh, is this the ice gods telling us we shouldn't be on the ice today? Or is this a little divine intervention? Yeah. 
but like don't push your luck too far you know? no so it ended up um i i changed my clothes put took my wool clothes off and put my uh, car hearts on i went over and uh, him and i pu- pulled out the battery went down and bought a new battery and got him back on the road and back on the ice and uh, he went out today and caught at least one nice lake trout nice yeah, yeah. Uh, that i know of right. so um he, he's he's been out he did good he was out uh, the day before yesterday he caught one or two um he's been doing good our other friend mike um the guy i talk about occasionally he caught quite a few white perch i think mm-hmm. yesterday um there's a bunch of a lot of the instagram people that i follow have been doing really good with rainbows mm-hmm. so they're catching a lot of fish yeah so it's definitely um uh, yeah it's 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 off to a good start um but as usual i'm behind the eight ball and haven't had put the time in but yeah so it's it- life for those of you who uh, subscribe to uh, youtube.com slash working class woodsman, um, we had a video last week um, where we both went out to Lake Winnipesaukee to check the ice. And it was. That not, was Wolf Bro Bay. Yeah. yeah, Wolf Bro Bay. Yeah. Not, not good. But then we showed um, video of, of you from uh, a couple of years ago yeah. out uh, fishing for white perch. Yeah, with uh, and, uh, another buddy, a Wayne. Yeah. Um, who I uh, haven't fished with yet this year, but uh, we we had a pretty good day that day. But yeah, that was, was two years ago. That was uh, you were pulling a lot of fish out of the ice that day. Yeah, we 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 did well. Um, uh, but again, that that we were incorporating the use of the Vexlar, which um, is very a really yeah. good tool. Now, but Vexlar, that's the brand name, right? So, yep. What exactly? To it's, explain for people who it's basically who sonar. Know. It's basically it's, sonar, yeah. I guess. And what it all it is is you you turn it on and it it'll give you the water depth and it also marks you. It'll literally mark your jig all the way down. Mm-hmm. And as you're dropping the jig down, any fish, well, you can see the fish coming up for the mm-hmm. jig, or you can see the fish activity if it comes up and looks mm-hmm. at it and goes back down. Um, it has literally revolutionized ice fishing. Um, yeah. Anyone who gets a Vexlar, the first thing they say is, "Oh." I, I won't fish without it. Yeah. If, if I forget to put it in my truck, I'll turn around and go home because right. it's such a good tool. Now, well, because otherwise you're literally in the dark. Yeah, well, that's how it used to be. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing. It's like ice fishing. We're, we've we've gotten on, we've, we've become a lot better ice fishermen over the years, and it's for two reasons. The lakes are in better shape, specifically Winnie. Um, mm-hmm. there's, there's more fish, more healthy fish, and the the technology that we're using now, we didn't have, you know, no one was using flashes 20 years ago. Well, we weren't, not right. that no one was. But, uh, you know, some of the jig, you know, just the equipment's gotten better, the availability equipment of equipment, you can go online and order whatever you need. Right. So there's, there's a lot of things that come into that, but the the Vexlar, the flashers, um, are probably hands down the most significant uh, change in ice fishing yeah. in, in my lifetime. Yeah. And I saw that there there are a couple other brands out there. Um, Hummingbird, Hummingbird, yeah, yeah, was one I saw. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's almost like because it's technology; it's using technology to advance. And there's two schools of thought. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Well, there's is one is it's like here we go again. You know, we're we're we're. uh, using the technology to increase our success so is it really fishing it's kind of like we talk about this hunting all the time you know the more tech the more technology gets involved the less you know it takes every time technology steps in it takes a little bit of the woodsmanship out of out of it yeah and same with fishing you know um when i was a kid we used to go out with you know wooden sticks jig rods and would you know chop a hole in the ice and you know we'd catch a fish once in a while but um (laughs) Yeah, it was brutal. Um, so you're catching, yeah. So you're just catching a lot more. Oh yeah, fish. Now. Yeah, and the catch and release now is a lot greater than it used to be. Like we didn't used to release fish. <laughs> it's like I'm not throwing that back. I've been three months trying to catch a fish. You know, yeah. I'm not kidding. It was bad. It was tough. It was tough. <laughs> I mean, we used to go winters where we would catch four lake trout all year, and now we'll catch six or seven in the morning. You know, and it's yeah. like, so it's, it's, oh. you don't mind throwing them back and lake, we don't eat toe or toe, I should call it. We don't, you know, we don't really eat lake trout anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I like to throw them back. They're fun to catch. Um, and it is indigenous to Winnipesaukee. Mm-hmm. So 
we've talked about that before, though. That Winnipesaukee is basically landlocked now, so there's no movement. Uh, as far as oh, you mean um, as far as fish coming in? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, uh, with the dams, there's, yeah. there's no fish. Although they are working on that with uh, there as they're coming up the, I guess the Merrimack. I think there's actually. I know we talked about this before. And I'm a little rusty, but um, I think the the shad have actually made it into New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. But there's still this. But for them to get from, like, um, let's say Manchester up to Winnipesaukee, that's probably never going to happen, just because of the way the the uh, the channels and stuff are structured now. But yeah, so it's landlocked, and the salmon are all all the salmon are all land you know put in there, put mm-hmm. in Lake Winnipesaukee. Um, by fishing game. Um, but quickly though, before we get, you had mentioned the website a couple of times. I've had a couple of people ask me if, um, cause I, you know, I do a little bit of writing on the words yeah, journal yeah. and, uh, I tend to, cause I've been so busy. I just haven't had the time to sit down and, and do more chapters in that, um, little fiction novel that I've been working on. And usually right around March when things start to slow down for me, I get in the mood and I start writing again. So that should start pick, picking up. Other than that little mindless uh, essays that I do on Instagram. Yeah. But I mean, so I, I usually start writing again in March if um, just to kind of clear that up. Yeah, so that we could talk a little, bit, a little bit about that as well because, you know, you, your channel, you when you started it, you called it the working class woodsman. Mm-hmm. And you're a woodsman. With a job. With a job, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And your job is um, very important in this part of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a type of job that takes up a lot of time. Takes Yeah, it takes yeah. up a lot of your time in the winter because well, you're yeah. heating. Yeah, I'm in the heating business. I'm a one-man show. I don't have any employees. Um, I do all the ordering, all the scheduling, all the calling, all the all the repairs, all the installs. So, yeah, no, it's, you know, after working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, um, I don't really have time. I don't necessarily want to come home. And I don't feel very creative mm-hmm. at 1, 11 o'clock at night, you know. After mm-hmm. you get something to eat, I just crash. Yeah. So that's why the videos kind of slowed down in the fall, too. Um, you know, we just I just don't have the time. And, you know, everything we do, we're not, you know, we, we, we're out, everything we do is out of our own pocket. We don't have like mm-hmm. people saying, Hey, you know, here's, you know, go do this. Here's, you know, here's some airline tickets and a, and a couple of, <laughs> couple of permits. Go, go shoot something. We don't, we don't have that option. Although we wouldn't say no to that. We <laughs> wouldn't say no to that. Um, but anyway, uh, and you know, a lot of our listeners are very generous and I've, we've received a lot of gifts over the years. Yeah. And stuff. But, um, but anyway, so yeah, just clearing that up. As far as the writing goes, if anyone's interested, um, that yeah, Ed's been working on this um, long form. Well, yeah, basically a novel is going to end up being eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a couple going, but this one I want to finish. I want to see this one through, and hopefully by the fall, I'll actually have something in print. Okay. And uh, it is what it is. You know, it's uh, kind of it's something I've been had in the back of my head for probably twenty years. Mm-hmm. And um, anyway, if you well, you can you can read. The story so far at uh, workingclasswoodsman.com. Mm-hmm. Under the um, Woodsman's Journal, and it's carving a home in the North Woods. And right. I think I'm up to Chapter 11. Yeah. Chapter- and those aren't necessarily chapters. That's just how I'm breaking up the, the pieces. And we'll figure it out later. Yeah. yeah. I might go Pulp Fiction with it and just yeah. start mixing or mixing stuff up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the first scene last and the yeah. last scene yeah. first. And, but uh, yeah. so, so anyway, yeah. So this morning uh, – uh, um, so you you didn't get any fishing done? Uh, no, and you still don't have your license. I do. Oh, you did. I okay. do. I actually went to the one of the little local bait bait shops in town, and I uh, he, he said, "Well, he goes, I'll give it a try." But and it worked. So I I am legal. I can legally go hunting and. So this uh, is fishing. the woodsman's equivalent of the first two weeks in January at the gym. So <laughs> I go to the gym in Wolfboro and. Uh, it's always more crowded right after New Year's when people have made their resolutions. I'm going to get fit this year. Yep. I'm going to go to the gym yep. for like. Two, and this is this has happened in other gyms that I've been a member. It is of. most a lot of people. It is the New Year's resolution. Yeah. I'm going to start eating right. I'm going to you know now yeah. the holidays are out of the way. And, yeah. And then some people see it through. 
Yeah, some people do. But uh, on the other note, um, as I said, Randy. But so in the beginning of January, when yeah. everybody's licenses run out, they all have to go <laughs> renew their license so the website so crashed. It, yeah, right, exactly. It's like you go into the gym to work out and the, and the door's locked. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but anyway, um, but as I said, we got Randy back on the ice, and he had some success. Mm-hmm. But uh, also. Um, and Randy, of course, well, I think he mentioned this, but he's it's Randy Rodko, and he makes custom rods great yeah. custom rods oh they're great i love them i've got a bunch of them and uh all different but uh he's also we did the squirrel hunting video a couple three weeks ago yeah it was a lot of fun about a month yeah. ago yeah. yeah we had a blast yeah. um got a couple squirrels and uh, i did a i cooked them up uh in the it's in the video but i i did my what i call squirrel miso and yeah it's a it's a good it's a good recipe. Um, we got some comments on that video too of like, oh, I'm glad you showed you know cooking it because uh, you know how do you cook a squirrel? Well, there's a there's a bunch of different ways. I specifically prefer to cut the meat off the bone and tenderize the meat and then cook it in in a bunch of different fashions. Um, mm-hmm. There's an old uh, my my grandparents used to um, actually steam the whole carcass. And um, pull the meat off the bones, and then you can fry it up. You can deep fry it. Right. I don't deep fry food anymore. Right. Um, you can actually you can fry it up in a pan, but most people don't find that experience very pleasurable. Um, you can you can cook it on a stick over a fire, but it's like I'll be honest with you, it's like chewing shoe leather. <laughs> it's survival food. Yeah. Um, uh, and the, the, that squirrel, those squirrels had a lot of fat in them. The ones that you shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah they were big, they fat, were, healthy squirrels. They were- Big, yeah. I mean, yeah. real big. Yeah. Um, for Can around you, here, you want to talk about how they could take some real, real punishment? Oh well, one of them, the the one that I had to chase into the hole, he ended up with um, you know, a couple of rounds of twenty two on him, and then as I, when I was cleaning him out, he had a BB in him. Yeah, I yeah, mean, and you showed that in the video too, of like tough, yeah, tough here's squirrel a BB, like somebody yeah. had. Some kid. Maybe. I mean, when I was a kid, we used to we used to hunt them with air rifles, and it was one shot, one they were done. But yeah. this guy had. I mean, it took a couple of rounds of a twenty two to get him down, and then it, it, they're they're getting tough. Yeah, and which is good. Yeah. They're bigger, so it means more more food. But so if you shoot yeah. five of those in a day, well, not if not good if they're in my no in my attic. No, <laughs> no, and everybody's got them. But they're a good they're a good source of protein, and they're, they're great eating. And uh, don't don't be bashful. I mean try it yeah it's definitely worth it but we had a good we had a good squirrel hunt and i i've said this several times on the podcast before but it actually floors me that there's a an actual squirrel season season. you can't get over that can you (laughs) it's like to me they're just like (laughs) they're squirrels yeah there are a bazillion of them just shoot them (laughs) you have a hard time talking to anybody that lives in the city it's like you gotta be kidding me we get those things running across the telephone wire we can't get rid of them but it's it is a resource yeah. And you know that's it's managed that way, and so I'm glad there, they have a season on them. Is there a limit to how many? You can? Five squirrels a day, per day. Yep, yep. Um, but anyway, uh, so uh, we were also talking. And you need a license. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Now you can also get in New Hampshire. You can get a small game license, uh-huh. uh, which is a little less expensive. Um, so if someone just wants to hunt small game, they can. They can. Uh, I don't know what it costs. By comparison, but it's a little bit less. So that would be squirrel hair. Uh, squirrel, snowshoe hair, pretty much anything except uh, deer, bear, and moose. Mm-hmm. Um, and But anyway, as I said, the squirrels were very fat and healthy. And so far, the deer that we've seen don't seem to be uh, starving to death. But um, it, as we talked about in the last podcast, there is an issue with the lack of acorns and, and so on and so forth, which kind of brings up a uh something you wanted to talk about yeah so um with what we had talked about in the last episode in mind um about how there aren't you you haven't seen as many acorns none around zip or beech nuts um, for that matter or beech nuts and actually that's in what i'm wanting to read for, for those of you watching uh i don't know if you can see that this is book here is called the hidden life of trees the hidden life of trees, what they feel, how they communicate, discoveries from a secret world. And it was uh, the New York Times bestseller. Who wrote that? Peter Wallabin. I've never I've never seen the book. W-H-L-L-E-B-E-N. 
Uh, and I wanted to read to you a, sec a section about uh, oaks and beaches. And this is, I think this is actually about European forests because I, they mention boar. We don't really have boar. Well, we're not supposed to. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've eaten boar, but. Yep. Uh, okay. So what I wanted to read to you here was um, boar and deer are extremely partial to beech nuts and acorns, both of which help them put on a protective layer of fat for winter. They seek out these nuts because they contain up to 50% oil and starch, more than any other food. Often whole areas of forest are picked clean down to the last morsel in the fall so that come spring hardly any beech and oak seedlings sprout. And that's why the trees agree in advance. If they don't bloom every year, then the herbivores cannot count on them. The next generation is kept in check or the next generation, I guess, of the, the animals, mm -hmm. is kept in check because over the winter, the pregnant animals must endure a long stretch with little food, and many of them will not survive. When the beeches or oaks finally all bloom at the same time and set fruit, then it is not possible for the few herbivores left to demolish everything, so there are always enough undiscovered seeds left over to sprout. Mast Years is an old term used to describe years when beeches and oaks set seed. Hmm. So it's interesting. That I thought was very interesting. And um, if anybody's list, uh, interested, I, I'll put the link to this book, uh, the Amazon link in the description, so you can check it out. Um, so trees apparently, they actually can communicate in a certain way that we don't perceive or understand, but it has to do with like chemical releases. Well, if it, you know, think about it, if there weren't any trees, we wouldn't have any oxygen to breathe. Well, exactly. You know, it, it's, and that's the other thing when you, th I mean, again, let's not make this uh, in any way a political podcast, but <laughs> people complain about CO2. Yeah. There were no CO2, but then all the trees would die and then we would all die. So, it is a tough balance. It's a tricky balance. But um, the trees actually, so the, the oaks and the beeches, they only produce their beech nuts and acorns, mm -hmm. you know, like every other year. And you would, it's, it's not that each tree does it, does that every year. It's all the trees the same year on the same year off, according to this book. Um, and, I was surprised at that because I thought, well, this one tree will be on this year and off the next year, and the tree like down the road will be on a different schedule, right? But they actually somehow coordinate. Well, I wonder if like you take aspen, okay, um, which is the largest organism, on, on, right? You know, because they're all connected. They're all through connected their, through their, their root roots. system. Yeah. So. I mean, it, it, there's some some communic. Now we're going to get a little hocus pocus here, but there is yeah. there is some communication through all living things that we don't un, we don't necessarily yeah. just because we don't comprehend it doesn't mean it's not happening. Right. So uh, some it's you know the, a lot of factors must come into it. I don't I don't know how to explain it intelligently, but somehow they communicate through their root system. Yeah. And uh, you know, you think about a tree. I mean, what is it? It's connected to the you know it has its roots in the ground. And the leaves, you know, the branches leaflets in the air, and they, it's just, uh, it, it's amazing. It's just amazing. And it, it's scary when to think of how, like, haphazardly we just cut, cut them down and think nothing of it. Yeah. Yeah. And the impact that that has. Well, um, so elsewhere in this book, uh, the author talks about um, how humans, when, you know, trying to sort of, what do you call it? Uh, husband the forest, or you know, husbandry of the forest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That the idea that some people had was, well, we should thin out the forest so the trees aren't so close together, so that they can grow better. And it turns out, well, that's good if you're doing that for lumber. 
because the trees will be straighter, but they're not necessarily better off because in nature they do grow very close to each other and different species of trees actually depend on each other in certain ways. Well, yeah, and there's a couple schools of thought on that. For instance, if you didn't manage, let's, let's, let's use the term mechanically thin. Okay. Yeah. If you didn't mechanically thin the forest, then uh, a lot of wildlife couldn't survive because, because very little wildlife can survive in a hundred percent wilderness. Mm-hmm. Like the white mountain national forest. You don't see a lot of white tailed deer. Because um, it's too thick. Cause it's too thick. Yeah. There's, there's no habitat. Um, Moose can th- survive up in there. Black bear can survive. Mm-hmm. But uh, like whitetail, the Virginia whitetail, which is what we have around here, um, needs those edges. It needs those those cuts. It needs those shoots to survive. And they're an edge creature. Mm-hmm. And it's the same deer from West Virginia all the way up to northern Maine. It's just adapted. Mm-hmm. But so we need we need the 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 logging, if you will. Yeah. Um, you know, but but it's it's a balance, it's a tough balance. Like the, the problem with the with the, like the timber industries is it was just it, there was no regulation. I mean, it just it caused a lot of problems. You know, a hundred years ago when they just literally clear cut every tree, yeah, and took well, all the old old growth, right? And Maine and New Hampshire, you know, used to be the most deforested states, mm-hmm. at least I guess on the east coast. I mean, obviously, some of the states out west never had any trees. <laughs> No, um, no pasture. But, yeah, but that's a different type of country out there. But Maine and New Hampshire are now the most forested. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the eastern woodlands are very yeah. wooded, wooded and wet. Yeah, as the best description for it. Yeah. But you know, the the problem is like when you cut down those old growth, and there's no fixing that. Like you know, after they've cut down all those old growth, well, forests, you just have to wait. Well, yeah, hundreds of years. <laughs> but you know, the, they've, you've lost the watershed. You know those because that's a lot of problems with the with the rivers. Like in northern Maine, it's like the rivers were always seem to run dry because there's no there's none of that old growth forest to suck up the water and hold it over the course of the summer. Right. And so so every action is a reaction. Mm-hmm. You know? So it all just it drains out. Yeah. There's nothing to hold it. There's no sponge. Right. If you will, and that's then it goes dry. Kind of an analogy. Yeah. 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 Whereas the old you know the old watersheds you know the forests used to hold the water and then it you know, would slowly – so the rivers ran more consistent. I've read that they have issues in California where because of their stance out there that they don't want to dam the rivers, that all the water – it's they have a water shortage in California, but they don't necessarily have um, a lack of rain. In all parts of the it's state, just, but and it just if, runs if they, off. If they manage the water better, they could have enough water for. But then they so you live in California and like you're not allowed to water your lawn or your garden. No, nope. you know, and it's all about land management. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know much about the country of California, but um, yeah. <laughs> but it, it, you know, every time you pave a drive. A, Build a road, pave a driveway, put up a Walmart or whatever. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing anyone or anything, but you know, you, you've, you've, the water will no longer stay there. It's going to run off, and it keeps running off, and and that's the problem. You know, every time they build a house or they put up a supermarket or they mm-hmm. put in a parking lot, you've played with that natural mm-hmm. infrastructure of, of the earth, and there's a price to pay for that. Right. So even yeah, they could rain every day. But the water's just going to run off. It's just going to it's just going to cause wreak havoc, and it's mm. not going to end up where it's supposed to be. Right. Um, it's kind of like you know trying to manage. It's in. I don't know how you ever. I don't know how you'd ever put, ever fix that. Somebody Even, who makes more money than I do would be able. To yeah, I, I just what I mean is now the now we have such all the infrastructure and uh, in place. I don't know where how you would ever how you'd ever fix that mm. fix that problem, but. And it's kind of funny because, you know, like when people's water tables are down, it's like, yeah, the well is still not really where it's supposed to be. Well, it's just been raining for six months. It's because the water's just running off. Mm-hmm. Nothing's holding it. You know, it doesn't stay with it. It doesn't stick with us like it used to. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a big problem. And, you know, obviously we're people in, I mean, I, I, I don't really know much about, about it, but I know, I know it's a serious issue. Mm-hmm. But to bring it back to the trees, um, 
you had noted though that that there was a, like a bumper crop of acorns last year before yeah, yeah. yeah year before yeah and um and this year not but the deer you say seem to be okay so far well according to um it's part of that that it's a pretty mild winter so far yeah, yeah. i actually saw a deer on the way over here tonight and uh, oh really was able, yeah i get a little video it's on instagram those are cool. those are dope but um uh she didn't look emaciated and uh, there's only probably three or four inches of snow in the woods so they can still get around yeah. um the question is what they're eating i don't know but she looked okay she looked healthy yeah so, but you know, we still got a we still got a ways to go. But it's not like we're sitting here with three feet of snow on the ground either. Yeah, we have another four months of winter. <laughs> yeah, but it's the well, March is the toughest month for any wildlife around. You know, yeah. uh, that's when they're really looking for food, right. uh, even under normal whatever normal is. You mm-hmm. know, under let's say normal conditions, March is a very tough month for any wildlife to get to get mm-hmm. through in New Hampshire and Maine, New England actually. Yeah. But um, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, that that was very interesting, and um, definitely give that a read. I think the, I might have to borrow it. The hidden life of trees. Um, but as far as like uh, the upcoming stuff, I and mean, we're gonna we get a couple of months of ice fishing pretty much, and we're gonna wrap up the squirrel hunt this month, mm-hmm. and do a little hopefully do a little bit of hare hunting um, through February. But then um, usually around the end of February. Well, we also got the Winnie uh, Winnipesaukee Rotary Ice Fishing Derby. Yeah, which we might even I was I was we had discussed a little bit about maybe doing next month's episode of the Woodsman's podcast from out on the ice. Um, and, oh, do a remote? Yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah, yeah. I probably we could probably set up the like the portable ice shack and you know yeah not obviously have this elaborate equipment but. yeah that we, <laughs> no. it might be a little rough we'll probably just be out there with a camera and uh and it might be a more like a more edited version like we usually just sit down and talk for an hour well have you ever have you ever been to a Winnipesaukee ice fishing movie i have not there'll no. be a lot of editing yeah <laughs> unless it's lots of bleeding TV. or <laughs> unless it's tv ma i've got some funny stories to tell uh not not today but uh it's it's always been a very interesting yeah you started telling me a story about <laughs> something uh recently and i said oh maybe you should um tell the rest of the story you know on the podcast and you said this was with you and wayne and you said that's not a. oh yeah it's probably not appropriate for not the podcast. Appropriate no, for the podcast. No, it is, most of those ice fishing stories aren't but uh it's a good time and you know you uh it's kind of tr- it's a tr- you know uh it's probably the worst weekend to be out fishing because there's so much pressure. So many people. Yeah. yeah. It's more of a tradition. It's more of a, you know, it's the middle of the winter. There's nothing else to do. Let's go down and see. And things, one thing leads to the other. And by five in the afternoon, uh, <laughs> you've read some of the stuff I've <laughs> written about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a very interesting study of people. And I, I have participated in many of those fishing derbies. <laughs> <laughs> So, but for people who don't know what a fishing derby is, um, it's you're out there competing to see who can. Well, catch the the, the Winnie fish. Derby, the road, the Winnie Rotary Derby has changed some over the years. Whereas it used to be uh, the biggest tagged, what when fishing game would put rainbows in, they would tag a fish, uh-huh. and that used to take the prize. But what they've done in in the I don't even know how long they've been doing it now, but now it's actually. The biggest fish of each class uh, gets thrown in a pool, and then they dr- so a guy that catches a four pound pickerel. So they have multiple winners now. Well, there's only one grand. There's only one grand prize. Oh, okay. So what they do is at the end of the they'll throw all they'll they'll actually draw. So you could, you know a four pound pickerel can beat a twenty pound lake trout for the grand prize. Oh yeah. So there's it's it's kind of bittersweet. I think. I think more people are happy with that mm-hmm. than the – well, I don't know. It, it, it's, if I caught a 20-pound lake trout and somebody beat me out with a three-and-a-half-pound yellow perch, I probably would be a little bit like, really? Yeah. But it is what it is. I mean, you know, we all – everyone's got the same chances any way you slice it. But it's it gives it gives people more of a chance. Like you, if you could say you catch a uh, – you know, a, like a four-and-a-half, five-pound – well, that's a big pickerel, but a good-sized pickerel on some one of these small remote ponds, 
you literally stand a chance of winning the Derby with it, which is kind of interesting. Huh. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 it levels a playing field for a lot of people. That, yeah. You know, so it brings necessary. more people out. It does. It does. Uh, I guess. I don't really know what the stats are, but uh, it's, it's always, it's always in, it's always a, a interesting turnout. Well, that, I guess, that uh, with so many people out on the ice is. Well, think about it. Yeah. It yeah is, is where you, you have to be really careful about where you are and, um, or the people who are there should be careful because not all of them are from around here. No, it actually brings in a lot of out of state um, yeah. pe- uh, revenue and a lot of uh, out of state sportsmen and um, you know, people that aren't necessarily familiar with the lake, uh, you know, or the lakes, I should say. Um, you know, you can fish, you could fish the Derby on Lake Wentworth if you want or whatever. It's not just on Winnipesaukee. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. No, that's the thing. I mean, Lake Francis, I mean, any, uh, yeah. So you don't have to be on Lake Winnipesaukee to, to win the Derby. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's like I said, think of it as more of a tradition. And definitely, if you've never been, give it a go and, and see what it's all about. Well, but, I think we'll definitely try to, try to, that's in February. Be out, be yeah. out there. That when, weekend. If you go online, just Google, uh, uh, Winnie Rotary Derby, and it's right there. It's right there with all the particulars. And I don't know what the price of a ticket. You have to buy a ticket mm-hmm. to participate. You have to have the ticket before the derby. You have to have the ticket by Friday night before the derby starts. That's you know pretty mm-hmm. pretty obvious. But but anyway, that's in February. So once we get through that, um, by the end of February, um, you know you, you're looking at tapping trees for maple yeah. syrup. Maple maple syrup season. Yeah, that's that's a big thing around. Yeah. Yeah, I was just, I was just talking to um, uh, somebody over in Moultonboro whose family used to have a huge operation, um, several thousand gallons. Yeah, yeah, trees. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Huge. Thousands of trees. Yeah. I wonder what that was. Um, and yeah, I don't know his last name, but um, his his grandfather had put in. In this, like the seventies, the a boiler to f- that was is powered by you know oil to vapor to vaporize to do the vaporizing, yeah. Yeah. and at the time it made sense because it was cheap twenty cents a gallon. Yeah, yeah, for oil for oil. Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> and now like they don't do it; they can't do it anymore no. because no. it's too risky. Because you know you have a few degrees change in temperature and you don't have any sap for you know, days. Days. Yeah. yeah. And then to even turn the whole system on, you know, it's, it, it was something like, I mean, they were using, he said, um, a seven gallon gasket for oil. So they're burning. nozzle nozzle yeah a seven gallon an that's hour he, nozzle that's what he said holy smokes I mean the, what's the one coming out of my tank that's like point a, point eight five yeah <laughs> an hour you could have eighty five eighty a yeah it's point eight five gallons per hour so I mean this is a big operation <laughs> you could eat Gillette Stadium with that yeah so <laughs> not literally but yeah. You know. <laughs> That's amazing. So they don't do it anymore. No, I don't doubt it. It's not worth it. No, 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 that's 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 some serious BTUs there. Yeah, Um, I could do the math on it, but my head my head hurts. But um, but anyways, yeah. So that's kind of what we're looking uh, what we're looking forward to in the next couple of months. Yeah. And um, like I say, hopefully, uh, I don't know if we'll do a podcast before the our next podcast might be Derby weekend. Might be the Derby, yeah, yeah. because it's about a month from now. It's like second weekend of February. So maybe we'll do that. But we have to look forward to some uh, ice fishing, obviously, and maybe some demonstrations on some of the tools that you use, like yeah, we're gonna. Logger. Interestingly enough, yeah, because my friend uh, Mike and Randy are, have adapted the. Uh, um, they're out there with their cordless drills now. Yeah, and those you know the, the augers uh, adapt to that, and I used theirs last weekend. I was pretty impressed. Yeah, um, I was actually amazed at how. Quick they are, and like a, a cordless, like yeah. Yeah. high impact, yep. just like 
cordless drill. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I was amazed. It's light. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still fighting with old steel gasoline. And my friend Al, Big Al there, has his propane auger, which we like a lot because it always starts and runs. It's a, a little less – it's a little underpowered compared to the old – my old Jiffy. But, you know, so we're going to kind of like uh, – this year it's going to be – Kind of like, what does it really is the best way to go? Yeah. I'm kind of starting to think that those rechargeable augers are the way to go. Yeah, honestly, yeah. They're, they're very light. You can throw them in a sled, pull them around. I mean, my aug, my S auger weighs a ton. Yeah, I got an old Jiffy Legend. Well, it's not old actually. It's I guess it's ten years old, but um, you know, it runs like a champ. Yeah, but it's heavy. You got to deal with gasoline. It's this. It's that. Um, so we're gonna kind of weigh that out. And uh, hopefully Saturday, this weekend, actually, uh, Mark, remember Mark Patterson, who mm-hmm. was on the podcast? Yeah. Yeah. He's supposed Registered to come. main guy. Yep, yep. He's hopefully coming up this weekend. And we're going to do a uh, combination squirrel hunt slash ice fishing. Nice. Uh, extravaganza. So it'll be a woodsman surf and turf. Nice. He's a great guy to hang out with. Yeah. So uh, that'll be fun. We're doing that this weekend. And hopefully I get the ranger on the trailer. And that's ready to go, so we can do some. You know, if we go ice fishing, we'll be hopefully pretty aggressive about it. And uh, Randy's going to be out there, um, probably Al. Hopefully by next weekend, we'll have a pretty good crew out there um, going at it. So we'll see. And we'll uh, we'll hopefully get that up on the channel as well, so you all can see. Yeah. And um, unless you have something else you want to throw in. I think we can uh, oh, wrap, wrap up it up. up. Um, no, I think we got it. We got the uh, um, upcoming events. Yeah, no, that's pretty much it. That's the progress so far. It's and, uh, January. Uh, it's very warm, although it's a little chilly in my attic right now. Yeah, we could hang meat here, actually. Yeah. <laughs> you got a heat guy? <laughs> yeah. Who are- <laughs> I keep on calling him. He won't return my calls. <laughs> well, he doesn't. I don't think he takes calls Monday through Friday. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's what it is, but yeah. So anyway, we're, we're, I'm very optimistic about this year. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, after last year's hunting season, I'm kind of, I'm over that. So oh yeah, well yeah, we t- <laughs> were talking about the deer last time, and there was another week left in the season, but yeah, you didn't get, didn't, didn't, you didn't, didn't get make it, it happen. Uh, yeah. I, I went back. I have spent some time in that area, and the deer are still following more or less those same patterns. But uh, I've got a really good. I get it really good, scoped out really good for next year, and uh, we'll see. You know, hopefully, maybe get back to North Carolina. Hopefully, mm-hmm. do it. You know, now it's just every you know, every year is different. Yeah. So anyway, thanks for watching and listening. This is the Woodsman's Podcast, which you can find on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play by searching for the Woodsman's Podcast. The Woodsman is Ed Butler. And I am Max Ledoux, and we very much appreciate you watching and listening. Thanks for the time. <laughs>